Hey everyone, welcome back to the All Music Matters Net Podcast. I'm your host, Brian. And joining me today, all the way out of New Zealand, Andrew Rooney. How you doing, brother? Doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. Well, I know I related to all the Rooneys that are out here in Pittsburgh, too. They're actually the owners of the Pittsburgh Steelers, believe it or not. So I'm actually Is curious. Is that right? Yeah, so I'm actually curious. Are you related in any way? I I hope so. Let's make it happen, man. All right. <laughs> That's pretty sweet. Yeah, for the longest time, the Rooneys had owned the Steelers since, like, I want to say 70s. Well, I think the whole time my dad's been alive, to be honest. So I think recently I just switched ownership. But regardless, uh, how you been, mate? How you doing? Yeah, I've been good, man. So, um, yeah, I've been looking forward to this. And I know we've had to reschedule a few times because I've been overseas and and then got sick, as you do, on a long-haul flight. And I'm glad to be here, man. I was say, where'd you guys go? We went over to South America. My wife's from Chile. And um, she had to actually go over for work, a uh, work trip, and uh, we we tagged along. So we turned it into a three-week holiday. So, yeah, it was good times. Because, like, the capital, uh, Santiago? Yeah, we were in Santiago. We were in a place called, uh, what is that place called? Chicoreo, I think it's called. And um, stayed with the family there. I've been over three times. So I'm, I'm sort of used to it. Um, but, um, yeah, no, it was good. I was say, I've never been to South America, too. How is Chile this time of the year? It was actually getting cold, which was surprising because every time I've been to uh, Chile, obviously, the time of year we've normally gone, it's been uh, really hot, like sort of 40 degrees. Oh, well, I don't know what that is for uh, you guys on Fahrenheit, but it's um, crazy hot. I would 40 imagine. degrees uh, Celsius. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine... Uh, I know zero degrees Celsius is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, for us Americans, we would say that's probably 90, maybe over 100 with plus humidity as well, which just adds to it. So pretty yeah. hot, needless to say. No, it was, it, was, it was actually a lot like the weather here in New Zealand at the moment. So um, we were woefully unprepared wearing uh, shorts and Hawaiianas and we... Um, Needed to buy some new clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I, I do have to ask because uh, you're actually the second drummer I got out of uh, New Zealand. Uh, do you know Joshua Drummer by any chance? Joshua Drummer? He's out of New Zealand too. He's a young kid. And uh, I actually, last year I actually interviewed him and his dad. And uh, they're based out of New Zealand as well. Oh, right on. Well, no, I'm I'm surprised. Is, is he a, is he on YouTube and oh, yeah. social media, is he? Oh, yeah. He's tearing it up. Little guy that's got Joshua potential. Joshua Drummer? Check okay. Josh, check to- Joshua Drummer NZ that way because it's meant to distinguish himself, I guess, from any other Joshua Drummers who might have the name on YouTube. But he is from New Zealand, so that's I was curious okay. if you I'll guys knew to, each other. Um, well, that's um, that's news to me, man, and I'll definitely look into it after this. Well, I do see how some of your YouTube channel works too, so I would have thought he would have been on one of your reactionary videos to be honest. But uh, yeah. we'll get well, we will get to your YouTube channel just a little bit too, so uh, so. Andy, the way my podcast works is I like to invite people on just to get to know them more, both as the individual, but also as the drummer or a musician, I guess, whatever other instruments you probably play, xylophone, cowbell, whatever you may have it. So, uh, so I got my questions right here, ready to roll. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's start with the first one. Tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into drumming? Okay, so I was actually a front man, believe it or not, front man slash rapper in my high school band. I didn't play any instruments. That's probably why I ended up out the front. And um, we were a pretty good band. Like, we, we did really well. We played all the crazy high school stereotypical parties. And um, was we had a really good following and everything. And... Honestly, I just felt like I wasn't the guy to be out the front. I actually dug what was happening in the rhythm section, and that's kind of what, I don't know. I like to sort of be behind the scenes a little bit more, and and the the whole rhythm thing just started appealing to me. And um, I actually got into drumming uh, pretty late, I guess, for a professional drummer. I must have been 16 when I got my first drum kit, so... Yeah, it was a it was a bit of a weird route and probably a late route. I was actually since you were saying rap group, I was trying to picture you like one of those 
like a uh, NWA sort of groups or anything like that. Or if you wanted to be like Rage Against the Machine with like Zach yeah, Della Rocha. Yeah, it was definitely it was definitely um, sort of Beastie Boys slash Rage Against the Machine ripoff territory. And it was uh, a friend and I, and it was like a double rap um, thing going on. And at the time, <laughs> at the time, that was that that was the thing, you know. Um, even groups like Red Hot Chili Peppers and Faith No More, they incorporated a lot of that rock rap thing into their music. So it was very, very, very popular at the time. I think a little less for the Chili Peppers these days. I don't know how much they do with like the little rap. Oh yeah, these days. Anymore. Yeah, they kind of yeah. backed away from it. But I know, I know what you're talking about too with like uh, some of their older mm. material. And uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say. I, I think I want to say "Suck My Kiss" was one of their songs, but uh, "Give It Away." That's right. I was thinking of "Give It Away." Yeah. Yeah, that, but I was picturing like too with like the backward tie and everything too. Probably doing like represent that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, no, it was a good time. Um, and I, I sort of got the bug of, uh, you know, being part of a team, being in, being in a group, and just um, it's just such a addictive feeling being up on the stage and everybody's singing the words of your songs and, um, you know, that's that's just a great feeling, right? when you're when you're playing live and and it's and it's working and it's going going well so yeah i but i felt like i wanted to be more in the engine room if you like um as opposed to out front i'm just don't don't consider myself a front man and definitely not a singer that's for sure mm, i see you wanted to be more behind the scenes doing like the samples and uh some of the other stuff too actually do you know the metal band the slipknot by any chance slipknot yeah yeah, yeah, that's one of the groups that um, I featured on on my channel. Um, I did not know them before um, Joey Jordison passing away. Mm. I mean, I, I I knew of them, but I hadn't listened to them. Put it that way. One of the guys who does sampling for their albums, he's got like that spiked sort of mask too. His name's actually mm -hmm. Greg One Three Three, I guess. Whatever he got that from, and uh, you're always just seeing him most of the time. He's just like rocking his head, like always, like this back and forth too. So. I was like, would that actually be Andy in this case? If that would, since he's always behind the scenes. <laughs> I don't know how you feel whiplash afterwards. So, <laughs> so I guess, uh, have you ever done something with sampling or have you just kind of... No, no. I mean, um, weirdly enough, you know, coming from that side of music um, and the way I record and everything now is, is very primitive. You know, it's all live and just using condensers and... You know, I, I keep it very, very organic when I record. So, and I don't personally use samples or any sound replacement at all. Um, closest I've got to that is just doing shows like theater productions where I'm in the pit and, you know, I'm playing along to samples or clicks or whatever. He's in the pit. I'm thinking of the Testament song, Into the Pit, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, what was it necessarily that felt you? like drums was calling to you sort of way like there was that calling and it was like i gotta get on that drum set and play it yeah i think it was just the, the power of the rhythm section you know like it, it is the it is the rhythm section that sort of curls people's toes you know that's what that what that's what makes you feel good that's what sets the the tone and sets the groove and i've always been uh sort of a, a bit of an ensemble player in that sense um, I've never really been motivated by sort of solos and um, a lot of the shreddy, flashy stuff. I'm sort of more motivated by the groove and and that kind of thing. So yeah, it was just definitely that engine room feel about it of creating creating a momentum in a pocket. I think. I was gonna say the momentum of creating loud noises. To be honest, gets there how loud drums can be, but. Uh, Normally, the reason why I did ask that was because people have always said, like, oh, I've always started with, like, the pots and pans when I was just a young kid. I was driving my parents crazy, hitting on this and that. Mm. And then uh, other times it was maybe, like, music, maybe a drummer from, like, a specific album just, like, spoke to him. And it was like, there it goes. It clicks. That sort of thing, too. So, I don't know. Was there something like that at <coughs> all or no? Um, I mean, there was certainly, along the way, uh, music I loved. Um I mean, a really early one is uh, Grease, the Grease soundtrack, which my my mother had. And, um, I mean, I don't remember it because I was too young, but 
apparently I would just lose my mind. She would put the Grease album on. I could, I think it was a like double record, double vinyl. And um, I would just like demand it. And I'd have a tantrum, a full tantrum, if I couldn't get my Grease fix each day. So, I mean, even as a toddler, you know, obviously <laughs> feel, feeling the music. And, um, but then, I mean, th- the whole way through, I, I even had my sort of MC Hammer Vanilla Ice phase. And, um, and even younger than that, you know, hair metal, I was always into Guns N' Roses and um, Poison and all that kind of stuff. And actually, I think Appetite for Destruction, to, to finally answer your question, I think Appetite for Destruction was the first album, although I wasn't playing drums at the time, it was the first time I really noticed the drums and I, I was like, wow, that's cool, you know? And I still think I'm a bit biased because that album had a big impact on me, but I still think Steven Adler on that album is that's some of the best rock band album drumming you're ever going to get. I would agree, yeah, but it seemed like that was like their only album that... It was like the apex for Guns N' Roses. Well, it's the only they, album he's on. Was it? I, well, actually, I think he was on Lies, but um, yeah, I mean, yeah, things things were very inconsistent with that band, but that album is just pure fire for me. Oh, absolutely, dude. That's what I'm saying. They were never ever really top that. They may have been like songs like in between their whole career, if you mm-hmm. want to look at it too. But I forget what concert it was where Axl Rose just lost his shit and then like jumped into the crowd and started trying to attack this little photographer or whatever it was yeah so you can see why the band was a little unhinged as well as the whole drugs and everything too that's an interesting story but uh i guess let's jump into your drum set is it nearby by any chance or you got it in a separate room no it's not actually we're um uh i've got a separate teaching studio so i don't do any teaching or playing from home um i do have a td17 kvx roland e kit um and that's not even in the house at the moment either so um no i I can't actually (laughs) i don't have a nice backdrop of drums put it that way but um i'm in the in the house i just i just do pad stuff and then when i get to my teaching studio that's you know where i do my practice do my covers um and i've got a huge selection of drums there that i can choose from not all of them are mine but i've got a just a unlimited amount of drums to choose uh, i see i was gonna say yeah where did you actually shoot your drum covers because i i saw the one it was uh, just what i needed it was from the car so i was curious oh yeah so you got a separate studio so yeah yeah so that's uh that's my friend's building um and i i just rent out a, a room in there uh to teach from each week and um yeah, it's great because he's a collector. Um, I think he's got, I don't know, I think he's got about 30 vintage kits. So, I mean, you'll see me playing on my covers on the vintage Ludwig acrylics, uh, vintage, all other vintage Ludwigs. Um, yeah, he's got recording custom, a couple of Fibes kits, Rogers, Gretsch, everything. Um, very, very spoiled. I was like, forget yeah. about it. He's got it all, that sort of thing. Well, yeah, it's a bit of a case of that. I mean, I used to have about three or four kits myself, and I, I, there, was, there just came a point where I thought, well, I'm not playing at home, and I don't need to add to this whole pile. Um, so I kind of got rid of them all. <laughs> I, do, I do have a Pearl Crystal beat at the moment, which I have literally never, ever played. Um and my TD uh, KVX, TD17 KVX, and that, that's it. Oh, I see. I guess, do you have a preference between playing on electric or acoustic? Or do you mainly just hold the electric for, like, maybe if you do, like, MIDI or stuff like that to add to your drum covers? That, that sounds, I don't know. Like, how does it work? Uh, I, I prefer acoustic. Yeah, personally. I was going to say more, more so for the feel and everything. Yeah, I mean my background i ended up going through jazz school and and playing a lot of acoustic and it's just a little bit hard to go back from 
when you sort of look at the drum, this is going to sound horribly elitist, when you start looking at the drums like that, um, what's the word? I guess that purely, like when you're looking for like that tone and um, all of all of the shading that you get on an acoustic kit, um, it, it was it was jarring for me to go from that to an electric. Mm, I see. I'm going to get so much hate from the electric drum kit dudes for that, but ah, don't it's worry just, about just to deal with my background. So I will say, some drummers I know they would use the electric kits to like record like the MIDI. That way, then it kind of like yeah. blends in. But uh, oh yeah, I forget yeah. I forget who the one drummer was because uh, he kind of influenced me in a little bit. But he was a YouTube drummer. Mm-hmm. But what he did was he would use mainly the pads, like the toms and the mm-hmm. snare, to like record mainly like those parts but then like he would do the symbols it would be his acoustic set so he mm-hmm. had he had two basically like these microphones that i'm using for my little interview here he, he had two of these microphones so it picked up all the symbols and everything too so it would almost sound like when he actually starts shooting the drum cover it sounded like it was that acoustic set that he was playing on too so it was actually very well done i'll give him that yeah why it's uh, i think is his name right there's um so i mean some people don't have a choice right if you're living in a residential area or then and you have to do e-kit then you'll you'll make it work and you'll get really good at it and there's some really good e-kits on the market now so um um, i wouldn't say i'm against e-kits i mean just it was just to answer your question i I prefer acoustic No, no that's how most people would say it too i think yeah i really think anybody even everybody in the e kit community they would say like i would like to play an acoustic set I don't know because of the feel or maybe just something about it but also because of the sounds and everything too that come with it it's mm. <laughs> it sucks because even if you live like the apartments you end up with those rowdy neighbors who can't stand the fact that you're playing probably at three in the morning just doing that sort of thing so it gets to them after a while so you can see why yeah. sometimes you have to meet meet ends or something like that ends meet or oh, whatever it goes. so yeah uh, but I guess so you did answer that one. Uh, what sort of brand are your sticks, by the way? My sticks at the moment, I'm actually using the Drumio 5A sticks. So Drumio is one of my sponsors, and I'm a partner with Drumio. And um, they give me sticks, and I like them. <laughs> so, I mean, they gave me sticks to try out, and I'm not very fussy when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, you give me a 5A it's a 5a we'll make happy. it work and so now i'm really used to the drumio sticks so yeah drumio 5a recommend them i guess which one were you playing before you jumped into drumio or they sponsored you uh vic firth 5a's yeah yeah I, I so again again that's a very standard stick right it's not it's a normal stick I mean, people would normally go with like the big brands or names. I mean, that's technically how it goes when people want to like look for. Well, Drumio, the Drumio sticks are Vases, so it's not like um, it's not like a tin pot, cheap, cheap stick. It is it is a Vata five A, but it's just Drumio brand. Vater. It's pronounced Vater. Yeah. Va- really? <laughs> yeah, it's V A T E R. It's a okay. It's German for father, and you know what? Actually, I was doing an interview today, and they it literally happened again. It was the kid was actually a drummer, and he does a jazz sort of music, and he was pronounced Vader too. So okay, and you're not the only one. I mean, I've had a good amount of interviews so far where people are always calling it Vader or almost like Darth Vader and that sort of thing too. So that always makes me remind me of my good friend uh, Rock Invader who dresses up as Darth Vader. And he plays drums, and his drumsticks light up they got a little red tinge to him whenever he hits the pads on his electric drum set so it's always interesting so but he's a cool dude so that's why when people say there you go vader sticks i always think i always think of him but they, it's meant to be pronounced vater so a little, <laughs> little bit a little bit help right there for you so there we go all right so that's pretty sweet yeah uh, I guess, have you been in any sort of cover bands before you made a jump to YouTube or have you kind of just been rolling with YouTube for a good while? Yeah, so I was in a, I started a covers band um, in 2006 and that was to get myself through uh, jazz school um, and it worked, paid my way through jazz school and I only just stopped playing in that group last year. So I did covers um yeah for 16 
plus years uh, solid. I mean, every weekend. So yeah, a, a lot of covers, and I recommend that as a drum teacher, as a great way to get mileage for drummers, is to is to play covers, learn great drum parts, try and figure out what makes uh, these songs popular and why people want to hear them. Not to say sixteen years. That's actually pretty committed too, because I know. It's not bad. I think more specifically, even the cover bands, they may go a couple of years if it's like real good relationships and stuff like that. But sometimes yeah. because of what COVID's done, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but I know COVID was one thing, or there might have been like other personal things because people want to go to, in this case, university slash college, because that's what Americans like to call it too, or family yeah. matters get on the way. We got a kid on the way, that sort of thing. So, I mean, 60 years, hats off to you guys, because that's pretty damn good, to be honest. So, yeah, well, well, the band's still going. I mean, I just stepped aside uh, partly because of YouTube and um, I just basically just needed a break. I mean, I, I mean, at this point I've done, I don't know how many thousands gigs and there, you know, it doesn't get any easier, all those setups and pack downs and driving home at 2 a.m. And I mean, the money's great, but um it's 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 work you know it's work i mean people can look at that stuff and say oh you're so lucky that you're playing drums for a living but i mean it is work it's it's not easy especially with a family and say, if yeah. you te- i mean i was te- teaching the next morning a lot of the time so you know you get home at two it takes you maybe an hour to unwind oh it takes me an hour to unwind after a gig anyway and um then you're back up and you're back to work and sometimes you got to make a call man <laughs> <laughs> be like something i need a break man i or uh, there's a an, there's an announcer in the college i was gonna i, I almost said nba but no he's in college uh dick vital is his name but uh we call him dickie v and i think one of his big saying was i need a timeout man that sort of thing so <laughs> yeah, absolutely it was, it was one of his one of the big sayings too so i can i can see why too in fact i almost came close to joining a cover group i joined for two practice sessions and that was the first time i actually played on an acoustic set in a good while because i've always rolled with the role in td25k for pretty much my whole drumming career mm. if that's what we want to call it but unfortunately and maybe it was for the best thinking back on it now but they moved on with a different drummer but for the time i had it it was actually pretty enjoyable i would have actually liked to at least have that experience even if it was playing in pubs with like small audiences for instance if i felt like it would have been nice but i guess did you guys play in pubs you just stay local in new zealand or did you go to australia every now and again no we uh i don't think we i don't think we ever played overseas but um we would travel around the country and we certainly started off just basically whatever gig we could get um there was a local pub uh bar that that took us on and and they loved us and we ended up doing a residency there and it wasn't long before we were starting to get booked out for private work um and then towards the end like well not towards the end probably for 12 years of the 16 years we were mostly a private corporate band you know wearing suits the whole the whole shebang uh, playing a lot of weddings and corporate style events. We say yeah. corporate too. I think like the ballroom sort of gatherings or all the yeah. Big I don't know. Well, I don't know if there's a, it might be a different term for those type of gigs in in the states. I'm trying to think actually. Um, basically, I don't know. Maybe Coca Cola needs a band for their Christmas function, and um, well, that would definitely be they corporate need a band. band. But... Yeah. So. Yeah, well, uh, you know, you know, they're going to need a band that isn't. Again, I'm going to get hate for this. That probably isn't what your local pub band is doing. You know, if your if your local pub band is wearing cargo shorts and and getting drunk and um, forgetting the chords to songs, they're not the right band for those t- <laughs> type of gigs, right? Yeah. yeah. So I guess yeah. <laughs> we were we were looking for good work put it that way good good pain work and and good good work i don't know where they would love weddings and to be honest but i know 
that one might involve maybe some sort of suit wearing but definitely the one you're talking about with like coca-cola saying like hey we want you at this ballroom for whatever reason or convention center yeah that, that i would consider that corporate and i think that'd be something we would agree okay. on what they would well, throw the term as yeah so that's pretty sweet was it you said it was mostly because of youtube because was this when your channel was really starting to take off because you're actually over a hundred thousand subscribers now right yeah so this all happened um with COVID. obviously when COVID happened and the lockdowns were in place um we couldn't gig so i could still teach i, I moved all my teaching to online so it didn't impact that a lot but all of my gig income which was basically half my income probably that was just gone um, not to mention a lot of time. So um, I had a lot of spare time. So that that's when I, um, yeah. I, I don't want to make it sound like I had some big master plan because I didn't. I think I probably got lucky more than anything. Um, I've got 118,000 subs now. And pre-COVID, I had about 600 not six hundred thousand, obviously, six, <laughs> literally six hundred. So um, that just that just shows sort of the power of that lockdown effect, and um, yeah, I guess putting a little bit more energy into that stuff. It's a big master plan too. I think like the the devious sort of or that says a lot to like Whoa, yeah. ha, 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 that sort of thing. <laughs> so I, guess I, would, I would love. To, <laughs> I would love to say like there was, you know, I was a genius and I figured out some great hack of the algorithm or whatever, but I probably just got a bit lucky and it was the right place and the right time. A lot of people were at home. Well, everybody was at home. And um, I started getting a bit wacky and probably losing my mind a bit and um, <laughs> started doing some different stuff on the channel, man. Mm, I see. But I guess so. Was New Zealand were they pretty strict with their policies when COVID was in full force? Yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. We had a, we had a, seems like a long time ago now, but we had a couple of lockdowns where you know, yeah, basically couldn't work and couldn't do anything. You could still go out, but um, yeah, businesses were shut down basically. So um, yeah, a lot of people were just at home and. I mean, in a weird way, it worked out well for us. And the and looking back now, it, things worked out well. Yeah, especially how you're able to grow a YouTube channel too. So I guess uh, so. Let's let's jump into the YouTube channel, then we'll talk a little bit more about COVID in just a bit. So uh, your YouTube channel, I guess. So when did you start it, and is there <coughs> something you hope to achieve with it? it started in 2013. Um, so I get messaged every week about you know what's the secret but hey man <laughs> i was uh i had under a thousand subscribers for seven years um and as you probably know if you have under a thousand subscribers you're not monetized so i mean who would work a job for seven years without receiving any money <laughs> so you could sort of think of it you could kind of think of it like that that um, it needs to be a bit of a passion, right? There needs to be a little bit of a reason behind it. And for me, it certainly wasn't to get monetized or anything. I wasn't even thinking that. It was just basically a video journal of my practice and my covers. And I wasn't even thinking of being a YouTuber or um, anything. It was it was just a, basically, a, I thought it was a brilliant way to cat. Uh, catalog my practice and you know it's a free free platform right it's amazing yeah you don't have to worry about paying anything, stuff yeah. up there and yeah yeah um so i kind of used it as just a bit of a database like that and um yeah i mean admittedly it's changed now again from a little bit of luck and that little bit of luck and youtube opening up the floodgates for me a little bit has um sort of encouraged me to, to take it a bit more seriously and yeah to answer your question of where it's going uh, i've got oh man i'm a i'm a big dreamer i've got so many plans but not enough time 
so many dreams so little time that sort of thing so yeah, yeah i can yeah. understand uh, i guess i got a short-term goal you're just gonna kind of keep doing what you're doing and then i guess see what you get out of it when uh, it's time to do taxes and all that stuff yeah i mean there's just so many things i mean i used to run a podcast my podcast is still up it's called the nz drummer podcast i mean i'd love to get back into that in video format like what you're doing right now um i mean i just really dug that real i there's nothing more i love than what we're doing right now and having geek out drum conversations you know um so there's interview the whole interview side there's uh, i mean gear reviews i would love to be doing gear reviews and in-depth demo stuff and better covers you know increase my quality on all that stuff so yeah i, I don't know man there's just so many things i want to do it looks like you were doing like drum covers but you're also doing like uh reactions to like other drummers who i guess we could say are either big youtubers or also well-known drummers i know <laughs> they're absolutely terrible with my uh spanish so uh I think the recent one was, it was the one, a uh, Span- uh, Hispanic drummer, I guess he was really fast with like his... Uh, Alice Depario Siberiano? Yep, that would be him. So I was, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, can you please yeah. say a name for me? Because I'm, a, I'm absolutely terrible at some of the names. <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. I mean, that's not his name. That's the name of his channel. But um, yeah, I mean, he's amazing, right? And that, I mean, what can you even say? Although I've done a, a bunch of reactions on, on him, um, you know, I'm not anywhere near that type of player. Not even close. So um, it is quite cool, I guess, to have a drum teacher looking at that and I guess reinforcing for a lot of people that, yep, he's very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could have told you that too, especially if you're like hitting the sticker, it's flying back, you're able to catch it, that sort of thing. So. <laughs> I mean, mean, we've got Houdini's tricks going on right here, so uh, I can see why. Oh, yeah. But I guess, uh, have you thought about doing vlogs? I know you mentioned about gear reviews, and uh, I guess you also want to do some of these podcast interviews. I guess you want to take some of my little formula now. So uh, I don't know if you... I don't want to say you're copycatting me, but I guess, were you doing something like that? Kind of like what we're doing right now? Uh, Sorry, did you say we'll be doing it before? Was I doing it before? Yeah, the NZ Drummer I guess podcast. So that was the full yeah, name of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So, I started that podcast in 2018, um, and basically, I was just copying. I was just in love with the Drummers Resource podcast, and what other ones? I'd hit that. I don't know if you're familiar with these podcasts. I'd hit that was maybe one of the originals, um, and I mean, I just I kind of thought, well, I want to do that for New Zealand drummers because there's some pretty cool stories here and a lot of the stories will be completely unknown worldwide, obviously. And um, yeah, I went from there and then I started interviewing world famous drummers and um, I mean, this is one of these things that just got put on the sideline when my channel started getting really big and I started to try and keep up with a schedule and I mean, as you know, doing interviews is time consuming and um yeah i just i want to find the time though yeah i can see what you mean too because i guess in a sense you were kind of doing multiple jobs in order to get the income and everything too because you didn't mention about drum teaching too i guess was this something you took on after you had graduated from the university teaching yeah uh so i i'm weird in the sense that i basically always taught basically for as long as i've been playing drums i've been teaching them um, I mean, not at any sort of high level. I guess originally it was just friends and and friends of friends would say, hey, you know, can you teach me? So I, I, there's a weird thing. I've always taught drums. Um, and then, yep, absolutely. When I left uh, jazz school, I, start, I started teaching basically full time, just teaching drums and playing drums. And that's all I was doing and living the dream. That's what I wanted. That is exactly what I had wanted. Um, so, yeah, I feel very lucky in that sense. I would say if people were saying, like, hey, can you teach me how to do drums? I, I feel personally I would have a hard time trying to do it because I'm completely self-taught, too. I don't know. Were you kind of the same way? Or did you also take other lessons with instructors before going into music school? 
No, I, I did take a lot of lessons. Um, I probably ha- had about eight teachers in total. Um, I was just one of these people who needed a lot of help. <laughs> I mean, I, I did teach myself to a point, but um, I always felt like there was something missing that I needed help, and I would see just phenomenal local guys playing and seek them out for lessons or you know i'd get really into latin music or jazz and i'd seek out the 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 guy and and that area who was everybody knew was the person to talk to so yeah i was yeah just always quite keen to upskill and get a good education i'd say the one thing that was for me personally uh I jumped on this podcast thing a little late too, especially with drumming and everything. So me specifically, I think I jumped it on a little later than you, for instance, that you said like around age 16, but mine was maybe probably around that time, but maybe a couple of years later when I was like 18 or something. So mm-hmm. I think what was funny, you feel like you have a dream for one to be <coughs> like, a, let's say like a police, police cop, for instance, or police officer or whatever, or something in criminal justice, but then your mind changes at some point it would be like, no, I'm feeling passion for something else. And mm. unfortunately then you have to like change course when you're in college and everything too. So I mean, I, I don't know. Was that something you kind of went through too? Or did you just uh, say like, nope, music all the way. Uh, let's do it. Uh, I was a little bit of a drifter. I think, man, I was not good at school. Um, I wasn't a dummy. I just, at the whole curriculum and the subjects just did not res- resonate with me man um I, you know there's there's a lot of these kids right i was gonna say like the whole don't... coffee field of the whole <laughs> yeah coffee field of like being rebellious yeah <laughs> they don't fit in in that world um and i and i didn't um i was always like in the smart class but i, I was the guy that you know, ah, oh, Andrew could do better. You know, as you know, that kid, oh, he could do so much better if he applied himself. Um, but I just couldn't apply myself because I wasn't interested, right? Um, and then you find something that you really love, that you really into. Like when I landed and uh, when I found myself in music school, and I mean, I was just twenty four seven. That was all of a sudden, I sort of found the thing I like, and. You know, I, I wake, I dream about this and I wake up and I want to hit it and I go to bed late because I'm playing gigs. You know, it's just, it was just total, total immersion at that point. That's very good to hear. Yeah. And say so pursue your passion and find what you love, even if it means you have to completely switch what you were originally pursuing in order to find yeah. something else. So, yeah, it's a little bit, it's I, I our mean, process, terms- yeah, but you know what happens. Yeah, in terms of work and jobs, you know, I, I worked just odd jobs that were basically not skilled at all. Um, didn't have any skills because I didn't have a education or, uh, I mean, a, a great, great grades or anything. And I just drifted around, man. Mm. Um, I found myself working at a summer camp over in California in uh, 2005. And I kind of had the epiphany there. I was surrounded. I was out of my comfort zone. I was an international <laughs> working at the summer camp in, in Carmel Valley. And I don't know. I, I was surrounded by cool people. We were having a great time and very inspiring people, fun people. And I just, I sort of got that light bulb went off that just do what, do what you like, do what you want to do and just worry about you know worry about how the chips fall later on just do it i was gonna say oh god they turn you into a hippie so no not at all <laughs> okay <laughs> cool people at least but they weren't at least the uh, tie-dye shirts with the guitars out and like not the crazy wigs and everything nope. so all right <laughs> nope. you're good you're good that's pretty sweet so that's an interesting story but i didn't mention about covid earlier so i guess you did mention how covid kind of shut it down and that kind of in a sense maybe slow down the whole gig process of you and your band well, it killed it it did kill it pretty good so i guess uh yeah i guess how bad did it affect you personally as well as your family and uh, community um i mean it was very concerning i mean if i 
if I told you that I'm going to wipe out half of your income tomorrow and there's nothing you can do about it, <laughs> you're going to be concerned, especially with a, you know, with a family. And, um, so yeah, I guess he's just start thinking outside the square, right? And, um, that was, it was a very strange time. It was a very strange time. I mean, can you imagine trying to explain that to people in 20 years? You know, lining up behind lines at the supermarket and uh, wearing masks and just the whole thing was bizarre, right? So, I mean, it had a lot of benefits, though. I got to spend some really good time with my family at home. Um, I got a little bit more tech-savvy with certain things. I... Um, you sort of value different things, right? You really value your freedom and you value going out and seeing people and yeah. I mean, overall, I'm a, I'm, I'm a positive person and I think overall it was a good thing for me and my family. I will say in past interviews, I always did ask, was there some sort of blessing in disguise? But I guess outside of, the, outside of being able to spend time with your family, I guess, did it allow you to expand more to YouTube? Is that how it was able to explode? absolutely yeah yeah it was just a, it was a funny thing i mean <clears throat> i noticed how much people were freaking out online um both politically and just socially people were just basically like losing it um although i was concerned i, I wasn't a, i wasn't there i wasn't losing my mind and like this is the end of the world so i started this thing called coffee with rooney and that was a live Facebook, uh, basically sort of update video thing that I did every day. Uh, and that was just to basically replace me having coffee with <laughs> literally going out and having coffee with people and catching up. Um, and that ended up being what I started to do on YouTube, which was, I guess, be a bit more myself, show a bit more personality as opposed to just play a drum cover. Um, and as they say, if you can be yourself, if you can find what sort of who you are, eat harder said than done, um, then it's likely to probably work out quite good for you. Amen to that. And uh, it's good to see you made through. And uh, I guess as New Zealand loosened a lot of their restrictions, is it somewhat back to normal now? It did. But I didn't want to go back to normal. So... Um, Obviously, we could go back to gigging and everything. And I thought, you know what? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want to just go back to exactly what I was doing before and just try and resume my life like nothing's changed because I think things did change. Mm. I think I changed. Um, and... So that's when I made eventually made the call to uh, stop gigging, which is um, crazy for me to say after all this time. And st I actually stopped gigging and started doing other stuff like YouTube. I was going to say, was that one of the hardest days of your life right there? Telling your friends like, hey, I'm, I'm calling it quits here, boys. <coughs> Man, I talked to people. I, I had a good chat to friends and... Um, I mean, a lot of my friends are professional musicians as well, and they totally got it because they've been there. They've been out. They've got families, and they've been out for decades playing music every night. And um, yeah, no, they got it. They totally got it. And so, off, some of them are in exactly the same boat where they're like, you know what, I'm gonna give it a rest for a while. <laughs> 